Evening everyone, lovely to see you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, there may be a few people coming a bit late, but I think we need to start. Can I just, as a means of general housekeeping, when I last gave a lecture, um, some of you know, I spoke to the chairman. I said, is there a necessity for you to tell people to turn off their mobile phones? Oh no, no, they never go off. And of course, as I was speaking, it was about 15 minutes, Sue, wasn't it? There was these strange ringing and it reminded me of the chimes. I thought I was uh, in an angelic presence. So if you do have any mobile phones, if you wouldn't mind putting them to silent, um, I won't be embarrassed, but you may be um, if they go up. What we're going to do this evening, um, and I'm very good on time, it will take about 45 minutes, but I'm hoping time will fly. Um, and in that time, I'm going to be talking to you about the Christmas books of Dickens, and I've chosen three in particular. You might be interested to know the first book that Dickens ever read publicly was The Christmas Carol, and he read it in 1853 in Birmingham Town Hall. He began by standing in front of his audience on September the 29th saying, it will take me two hours to read the whole of Christmas Carol, and three hours later he was still going. You'll be pleased to know, however, that I will restrict things down to 45 minutes. If you want to read the Christmas books, um, there are five of them in total. Christmas Carol, probably the most famous one, but funnily enough, not the bestseller. The second one, 1844, was The Chimes, which um, sold 20,000 copies on the first day, compared with Christmas Carol that only sold 6,000. 1845, The Crickets on the Hearth, 1846, The Battle of Life, and then there was a year missed out. In 1848, we have The Haunted Man, and then Dickens finished his Christmas books and moved on to Christmas stories, because he started to edit um, a publication called Household Words, which is a weekly, and the first Christmas story to appear in there was A Christmas Tree in 1850. So let's just give you a little bit of background to where Dickens started writing about Christmas because Christmas Carol was not the first Christmas story he wrote. It's always interesting to read with authors, always start at the beginning and read through. Now with Dickens he only wrote 15 novels. That's not an awful lot. Anthony Trollope wrote 70. So you can see that you can start at the beginning. So we'll just put on the next slide if we could. The very first thing that Dickens wrote about Christmas was this. I'm sorry, this is the only picture I could find. I was very surprised to find a picture. In December 1835, Dickens, in a publication called Bell's Life of London, produced a little short story called Christmas Festivities. And that was the first Christmas piece of writing that we have. I need to put to rest a, a popular myth, Dickens did not invent Christmas, okay? <laughs> Let's be completely sure about that, but he did bring about an aspect of Christmas, and that was to take Christmas from being a church community-based event into the home. This very first Christmas festivities, when it came out in Sketches by Bods and name was changed to Christmas Dinner, is typical of what Dickens was hoping to achieve. In the very few pages, Dickens paints a scene of a family Christmas gathering. Grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, children. And in introducing this scene, he very poignantly, um, the mother who is hosting it has two daughters. One is called Jane, who's done very well and arrives with the baby and the nurse. And a little bit later on in the story, there's a very tentative knock, because it's her other daughter, Margaret. Now, Margaret's done something terrible. She's done two things, actually. She's married without her parents' permission, and she's married someone beneath her socially who is poor. And as a result, she's been ostracised by her friends and her family. And this is the first event that she's been allowed at Christmas to join her family. And it's a very moving scene. Dickens is very good at pathos. He moves from sort of the comic to the serious before you even realise he's doing it. And there's a wonderful reconciliation. Christmas is for families, it's for enjoyment, it's for reconciliation. But the key focus for Dickens is Christmas within the home. Could we go to the, go to the next? Now, this is a very famous gentleman, um, Dickens' first novel, Mr Pickwick. Now, just a little bit of brief history. When the English Reformation took place, when King Henry VIII decided uh, to break from the Church of Rome, Christmas became not outlawed, but became marginalised. And in 1644, 
we have the Puritan Parliament that met on Christmas Day and they passed specific laws saying what you could and couldn't do on Christmas Day. For example, you were not allowed to sing weights or carols. You were not allowed to eat festive food and you had to work. So there was a period of about 100 years where a lot of the customs of Christmas died out and the only places where they were retained were in rural communities, particularly in the north of England and in Kent. Now this is important. Pickwick Papers was, although written in 1837, is set in 1823 and this is a picture in a very rural area where they preserved these Christmas traditions. And we have Mr Pickwick here with Mrs Wardle's mother, this food hanging up here and in where we have the mistletoe hanging down. So very much a traditional Christmas scene but 1823 would have been quite unusual. So that's Pickwick Papers. Now, where did Scrooge come from? Is there a precedent to Scrooge? Well yes there is because this is chapter 28 of Pickwick Papers. If you turn over the page you'll come to chapter 29. And sorry, I'm just going to reach across over here. Now in chapter 29 we have a story, do you want to go on to the next slide, called The Goblin and the Sexton. Now this is very important, okay, it's an interpolated tale just put in, it's told by Mrs Wardle's mother um, who is a very elderly lady in her 90s and she recounts a tale that her husband had told years before on Christmas Eve and she starts off by saying she knows this story to be true because it's so very, very old. And what happens in this story? We have the sexton, the sexton whose job it was to ring the bell but also to dig graves is very much like Scrooge. As he walks through the village on Christmas Eve in the dark with his shovel and bottle of drink, as he hears the merriment going on in the houses and the children playing, he starts to try and pick himself up by thinking of all the nasty childhood diseases those children could catch. As he goes along, he's walking with shovel, he goes along Coffin Lane and there's a child coming along going to one of the parties singing. So he hides behind a post and hits him over the head several times with a lantern from his troubles and Dickens records as he went on he was singing a different song. Gabriel Grubb does not like people. Ring any bells? He doesn't like people and what happens is he's digging this grave on Christmas Eve and he's confronted by the King of the Goblins. And what happens in this story, it's only a very short story, he's pulled down under the earth and he's shown by the king of the goblins and the other goblins who quite enjoy giving him a good kicking every now and again, a picture from the galleries of truth. And he's shown three pictures. He's shown a happy family scene, children, father and mother. He's shown a deathbed scene of a young child. And he's seen the families they've aged and the parents eventually die. And he's shown other scenes that Dickens doesn't show. But at the end of this experience with the goblins, Gabriel Grubb has become a changed man. Now George Orwell, commenting on Dickens, said that Dickens essentially was a change of heart man. He was interested in the changing of people's hearts. Anthony Trollope rather sneeringly said to him he was called him Mr. Popular Sentimentalist. But Dickens knew that sentiment, and what better time to write with sentiment, was the way to touch his readers' hearts. And Dickens touched the hearts of his readers in no other way that any other writer did. So that's the origins of his writing and the Christmas Carol. Could we go on to the next slide? So here we have it. Christmas Carol. This is the original. Published on the um, 18th of December, 1843. I want you, to, if you can, to picture with me. We're going to go onto the streets of London. It's a rather dreary, nasty, dark night. It's about 11.30 at night. Not the sort of time that you and I would want to be about in London today, but certainly not then. And as we look from Devonshire Terrace, a rather nice part of the city, a man emerges. And if we were to follow him, we would follow him for 15, 20 miles a night every night for six weeks. And that's how Charles Dickens wrote Christmas Carol. Everything he'd written before was serialised. He wrote this entire book, novella, very short story, in his head. He conceived it and wrote it in six weeks. He had great ambitions for Christmas Carol because he was working on Martin Chuzzlewit, the only novel of Dickens to be based in Wiltshire. The book wasn't doing very well. 
relatively speaking. Nicholas Nickleby would sell 40,000 monthly instalments a month. The old curiosity shop at the end, as Nell was about to die, was selling 100,000 copies a month. But Martin Chuzzlewit was only selling 20,000. Chapman and Hall, his publisher, was beginning to talk about renegotiating his fee. What Dickens didn't realise at the time, there was a general depression in the book market. A lot of critics think Martin Chuzzlewit was the best book, but he had great hopes. So the first day he sold 6,000, the next day 2,000 and 2,000. So he sold 10,000 in three days and it kept on selling, not just restricted to Christmas. But in those days, plagiarism and copyright were a very difficult area. And one, a, pair, a couple of enterprising publishers decided to publish Dickens's Christmas Carol in their own publication for 5p a week. It was selling considerably more. Dickens decided to take them to court. He won the case, but the company involved went bankrupt and he was charged £700 in legal fees. He made on Christmas Carol in that first year around £136. So although it improved his sales and his profile, it did not improve his finances. Can we go on to the next slide? I will be reading from Christmas Carol, by the way, um, for you very, very shortly. Christmas Carol is about the redemption of one man. Ebenezer Scrooge is a type. If you read Nicholas Nickleby, you'll see Ralph Nickleby. Ralph Nickleby is an individual who, quite frankly, has sold his soul to the devil. He attempts to sell his own niece, Kate Nickleby, to try and ensnare Sir Mulberry Hawk and Lord Vespot in his investments. He's a terrible man. And Scrooge is that type of man. And if you remember the book with that opening line, begins with the words, Jacob Marley was dead. It begins with death and it ends with a change of life. Now, we need to understand with Carol, Christmas Carol, and we're talking a little bit moment about the motivation. Dickens was motivated by two very specific reasons for writing the Carol, um, which will become apparent, I trust, this evening and as you read it. Um, now, Scrooge is an individual in need of individual redemption, but he is also a type of what was going on in society at that time. Enlightened people like Thomas Arnold, um, Tom Hughes used him as the head teacher in Tom Brown's school days, understood, as did Samuel Taylor Coleridge, that society had become obsessed with money. The poor were just seen as a cheap way of making goods and services to line the pockets of the rich. And Dickens was using Scrooge as a type. So we have the opening scene where Fred, his nephew, has come and spoken to him and said, Merry Christmas. And Scrooge has replied, in the immortal words, Bar humbug. And there are hats available with that written on them. They are black. My wife does have one. So if anything that Christmas you feel, you can always say Bar humbug. And just as Fred is going out the door, two men enter. This lunatic, that's Bob Cratchit, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this very night, being Christmas Eve. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits at the ominous word liberality. Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down his pen again. And the union workhouses, demanded Scrooge, are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law, are they in full vigour then? Said Scrooge. Both were very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their usual course, said Scrooge. 
I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they have scarcely furnished Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We chose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I've mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. Jacob Marley appears. And in this picture, now these pictures are drawn by a man called John Leach. There's eight illustrations in Christmas Carol. All the other Christmas books are illustrated by four or five um, illustrators. But John Leach, believe it or not, if you look at some of the illustrations, gained popularity in his illustrations in Punch, and that's where he mainly worked. And in this picture here, we have Scrooge, but we have Marley. Marley is bound by chains that he has forged in this life, and the chains are money boxes. And he says to Scrooge, you have lived seven years longer than I, and you too have a chain. Materialism had bound them. Could we go to the next one, please? And as Jacob Marley departs, he says these words, Mankind is my business. A complete antithesis of what Scrooge had said. And as they look out the window, there's an elderly lady here sitting on the ground. And these are pictures, this particular illustration is called Phantoms. There's a man in the front, he's got a great big safe box. And this is a man Scrooge knew per personally. They're trying to help this lady, but because they're dead and their time is over, they cannot help. The message, as Dickens was trying to put across, is we need to help people now. Tim? Mr. Fezziwick, very popular illustration, jolly, jovial man. And here we have at the party, Dickens, remember, takes Scrooge back to his childhood, his lonely childhood, and he's a clerk with Mr. Fezziwick. And every Christmas Eve, Mr. Fezziwick clears the warehouse, and for about 20, 40 people, they have a dance. Now, Mr. Fezziwick's very important because he is a kind employer. I mentioned to you Ralph Nickleby and Nicholas Nickleby. In Nicholas Nickleby, there's a pair of twin brothers called Charles and Edwin Cherelby. who run a merchant house near Threadneedle Street in London. Now, they are epitomise generosity and kindness in the workplace. Dickens is pleading to employers to teach and treat their employers well. And Mr. Becksniff, sorry, Mr. Fezziwig is an example of that. And of course, as he watches, he thinks of his own clerk, Bob Cratchit. Moving on to... And this is just... Christmas present. These are very interesting things. This is 1844. This is a traditional Christmas pudding. I don't know when we will be making this, but prior to that it was plum pudding. And this is where Dickens also came in. The idea of songs and poems and games which abound in Christmas Carol, but also food, the, the traditional Christmas pudding, plentiful and much food. The celebration of Christmas present. For those who know the story is that under Christmas presents road, there's two children that we'll see in a moment. Can you go to the next slide? Now this is the key thing. I said to you there were two reasons that drove Dickens to write Christmas Carol. Dr. Southwood Smith was a friend of Dickens. He was a great social philanthropist and did a lot of work with the poor. He was appointed as the chairman of the Empl Child Employment Commission. And in 1843, in the summer, he sent Dickens a copy of a report. Dickens was so incensed by what he read about how children who were four, five and six were working in the mines in Durham in the northeast, that he wanted to deliver a hammer blow against 
those things. And he wanted to write for the Edinburgh Review, but he delayed it. But all that angst and anger that he felt as he read that report, children who were five years old working 16 hours a day, six days a week, for the equivalent of 10p. Pregnant ladies, ladies with small babies working at the bottom of pits in the dark, climbing ladders, the equivalent of climbing up St Paul's Cathedral every day. He wanted to do something about it. And the other thing that drove him, in June he went, 1843, he went to a school called the Field Lane School. Field Lane School was in Camden and it's near Saffron Hill. Now that is where Fagan in Oliver Twist lives. It's a horrible area. And the ragged trousers of philanthropists were a group of people that tried to bring an education to that area. Dickens was so appalled by what he saw and so moved. Again, that was the driving force. Those two things drove him to write Christmas Carol. And here we have the two children, want and ignorance, that are hiding under the road. So you have this wonderful contrast between the wealth of Christmas and this is Scrooge talking. Now he's been changed now. He's gone looked and looked at his past and now he's at the end of looking at his present. Scrooge speaking. Forgive me if I'm not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I see something strange and not belonging to yourself, protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe he brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at his feet and clung upon the outside of his garment. O oh man, look here, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of an age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds, where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacingly. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade, through all the mysteries of wonderful creation, as monsters half so horrible and dread. Scrooge started back appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children, but the worst choked themselves, rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Spirit, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them. And they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both, and all of their degree, but most of all beware of this boy. For on his brow I see what is written, which is doom unless the writing be arranged. Deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out his hand towards the city. Slander those who tell, it, tell you. Omit it for your factious purposes and make it worse and abide the end. Have they no refuge or resource, cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons, said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck well. In 1853, when Dickens was in Birmingham Town Hall, he started a series of readings. And on the 28th and the 29th, it was to normal, wonderful people like yourself, who were paying quite a lot of money, and you're getting all this free. But they pay quite a lot of money to go to the Birmingham Town Hall. But on the Friday the 30th, Dickens specifically said, I want to attract the labouring and the working class of Birmingham to come and hear this lecture. So by his own bequest, he lowered the price to a bare minimum and Birmingham Town Hall was full up with 2,000 working class labourers. And in 1853, Dickens moved to the front of the stage and said no more than two words, dear friends. And at that point, the whole audience erupted in applause and cheers, for they knew that in Dickens they had someone who championed their cause, someone who knew and understood what they meant. And that, I would suggest to you, at the time and still, 
is the power of Christmas Carol. We need to move on. And this is a, a terrible scene. It, I won't say need to say much about it. Dickens is confronted by his own death. And the stony hand that speaks no words points <coughs> to his tomb. He's seen his past and his present and his future. Dickens is suggesting that the future of society, if it does go unchecked, may well result in that. The working class is rising up. The Chartist movement were moving at that time. 1848 was a time of um, rebellion across the whole of Europe. 1840s, there was famine, starvation. There were Chartist riots in Devizes, in Trowbridge. The poor were rising up. And then we have Dickens showing Scrooge having been transformed. He wakes up. He's described as being as happy as an angel. Remember the parody between the devil and the angel. And he goes to church and he has changed. Dickens is making the point there needed to be a supernatural intervention, just as the Grateful Grub. There needed to be a supernatural intervention for society. Man could not change themselves. And people were very deeply affected. We need to move on, Tim. Okay, Cricket on the Half, completely different book. We can cover that very quickly. 1845, when I said to you that um, Christmas carols sold 10,000 the first day, this sold 20,000 the first day. This was Dickens, it is most sentimental. Very hard-hearted man called Lenin, who you know from your Russian history, and we, we touched on last time, Dickens was very popular in Russia. Walked out of cricket on the half, halfway through, saying it was far too sentimental for his interest. The day cricket on the half, this is very interesting, within a week of cricket on the half coming out, there were 17 plays on the stages of London. One came out the same day that the book did. So you can get the idea that copyright and ideas were somewhat thing. This is another aspect of Dickens' work. He's going right back to the home, right back to the half, the crickets on the half, the sense of domesticity, the home, the sanctity of the home. We have John and Dot, and it is really a very uh, complete contrast to what was before and what was to come, a story of a family. John and Dot live together, he's a carrier, basically carrying things around, a modern day taxi, and Dot's a lot younger, they have a son, they have a nurse called Miss Torboy, and they live together, and one day a stranger comes along. An old man, but he's someone in disguise. But I won't tell you who that is quite yet. But in this story, we have a man who is again the Gabriel Grubb. Now, I do complain a little bit, I must confess, and that's a terrible thing to say. But I do complain a little bit about Jane Austen, because I reckon that she's a bit formulaic. But I've got to confess to you this evening, ladies and gentlemen, that Dickens is formulaic as well. Because we've got another Scrooge Gabriel Grubb problem. But this time, it's a man called Tackleton who is a toy merchant. And his company is called Tackleton and Gruff. And he's a really nasty piece of work. I'll just tell you a few, give you a few little words about him. Tackleton the toy merchant. Pretty generally known as Gruff and Tackleton, for that was the firm. Though Gruff had been brought out long ago, only leaving his name. And as some said his nature, according to its dictionary meaning, in the business. And the toy merchant was a man whose vocation had been quite misunderstood by his parents and guardians. If they'd made him a money lender, or a sharp attorney, or a sheriff's officer, or a broker, he might have sown his discontented oats in his youth, and after having run the full run of himself in ill-natured transactions, might have turned out amiable at last, for the sake of little freshness and novelty. But cramped and chafing in the peaceful pursuit of toy making, he was a domestic ogre who had been living on children all his life and was their implacable enemy. He despised all toys, wouldn't have bought one for the world, delighted in his malice to insinuate grim expressions into the faces of brown paper farmers who drove pigs to market, bellmen who advertised lost lawyers' consciences, movable old ladies who darned stockings or carved pies, and other like samples of his stock in trade. In appalling masks, hideous, hairy, red-eyed jacks in boxes, vampire kites, dynamical tumblers who wouldn't lie down and were perpetually flying forward to stare infants out of countenance his soul perfectly reveled a toy maker who takes pleasure in scaring children he's a gabriel grub he's an ebenezer scrooge and he's engaged to marry a lady called may fielding who is uh, in 
long-time love, Edward, has gone away to South America, but he returns just at the end. And again, we see in this story, we see Tackleton right at the end changed again. But Dickens uses this story very importantly to talk about people who are who have disabilities or challenges at that time. Unfortunately, Victorian society was very, very cruel. You know about asylums, of course. People who had today would be recognised having mental health issues or physical health issues were put either in asylums or they were put in hospitals. And Bertha, who is uh, the daughter of his employer, is blind. And Dickens wanted just to write a short passage to remind his readers about how we need to, they needed to treat the blind and the deaf with humanity and compassion. And this is Tackleton speaking directly to Bertha. I'm going to be married to May. Married? cried the blind girl, starting from him. She's such a confounded idiot, muttered Tackleton, that I was afraid she'd never comprehend me. Our Bertha married. Church, parson, clerk, beadle, glass coach, bells, breakfast, bright cake. Favours, marybones, cleavers, and all the rest of the tomfoolery. A wedding, you know, a wedding. Don't you know what a wedding is? I know, replied the blind girl in a gentle tone. I understand. Do you? muttered Tackleton. It's more than I expected. Well, on that account, I want to join the party and to bring May and her mother. I'll send in a little something or other before the afternoon. Cold leg of mutton or something comfortable trifle. You'll expect me. Yes, she answered. She had drooped her head and turned away, and so stood with her hands crossed, amusing. I don't think you will, muttered Tackleton, looking at her, for you seem to have forgotten all about it already. Caleb. I may venture to say I'm here, I suppose, thought Caleb, her father. Take care she doesn't forget what I've been saying to her. She never forgets, returned Caleb. It's one of the few things she's very clever at. Every man thinks his own geese swans, observed the toy merchant with a shrug. Poor devil. Isn't that terrible? But that was what was going on. Because she was blind, you know, she's stupid. There's still a little bit of that, actually, in our society, but it was far more prevalent there. And in the end of the story, Tackleton, who's supposed to marry Mayfielding, Edward comes back just at the last moment, and again, he's another character transformed. Right, we need to move on. The last one, The Chimes, 1844. This was... An extremely powerful... I wonder if... Let's do a quick straw poll. I think I know what the answer... Could you put your hands up if you've read The Christmas Carol? Well, well done, Maddie. Good. Could you put your hands up if you read The Chimes? Right. Now, you see, that's really, really simple. Now, funnily enough, I'm not surprised by that. But what I want to say to you is this. In terms of the condition of England question, The Chimes is far more important than The Christmas Carol. The Chimes sold... 40,000 copies the first day. It's an incredibly um, powerful book, and we'll just touch on a few things there. Now, first of all, at this time, it's October 1844. Dickens is in Italy, Genoa, and he's rented a palace. Now, I, would, I could attempt to uh, pronounce the Italian for this palace, but can I just call it, say it was called the Palace of the Fish Ponds? Okay. And he was there. Now, he it was October. He always wrote his Christmas books in October to December, usually in six weeks. He was having a traumatic time. He could not come up with any ideas. He was surrounded every night by a cacophony of church bells ringing on the hour, every hour. And he longed, as he was with the carol the year before, to be in London, to be pacing the streets of the place he knew. And he was really struggling. And then one day... John Foster, his friend, received a note, and all it said was a quote from Falstaff from Henry V. I heard the chimes at midnight, Mr. Shallow, and there we had it, the chimes. Now, just as I said to you that Christmas Carol was aimed to be a, th a heavy blow against Sir Dr. Southwood Smith, again, had sent him another article on this occasion, and this time it was about sanitation in London. I was about to tell you an horrific statistic, and I want you to think about this if you can. In 1847, which was three years after this book, but it applies to the whole 1840s, 1850s, 500,000 people in London were suffering from typhus fever. That is one in four of the population. 
The Lancet, which started in, the 18, in 1841, described London at that time as being a doomed city, a city of death. Those are alarming statistics, aren't they? And this is what fueled Dickens. He was off again. We go to the next slide. It involves this character here. I'm sorry to be out of focus. Toby Veck. Toby Veck is a ticket porter. A ticket porter um, is someone that would be licensed by the City of London with a badge. And if you wanted a letter or a parcel sent, you would go to a ticket porter. You can go to anyone else. It wasn't the postal service, because the postal service only just sort of started you would take your package and Toby Vett would spend a lot of his time sitting outside a church that was where his little seat was and of course this is where the chimes come and basically again it's a fairy story and I just want to read you to give you a feel one day he's sitting outside a house on a doorstep his daughter Meg who is a beautiful young woman has decided after three years that it's time for her to marry her beloved Richard the blacksmith because Richard and Meg have realised they were poor three years ago, they're poor now, they'll always be poor, but now is the time, and it's New Year's Eve to get married. But as they're sitting on this doorstep, they're sitting on the doorstep of someone's house called Alderman Cute. Cute is a bit of a giveaway there. Now an alderman was second in line to a mayor, he was a justice of the peace, and in the city of London you'd have the mayor, then your alderman, an important person. And just then, they come out, there's a man called Filer, who's a political economist, and there is this man called Alderman Cute, and this is what he says to Meg and Richard and Toby Veck, who typify the poor of the time. Now, the Alderman had not yet had his say, but he was a philosopher. That straight away, okay, that term philosopher meant something to Dickens' readers. Oliver Twist, the philosophers, were a term that Dickens used for those people who came up with the Poor Law Amendment Act. The philosophers were the people that thought the poor liked being poor, so let's make life really, really difficult and harder for them so they won't like being poor anymore. It was a euphemism for those people who oppressed the poor. Now, Alderman had not yet had his say, but he was a philosopher too, practical though. Oh, very practical. And as he had no idea of losing any portion of his audience, he cried, stop. Now you know, said the alderman, addressing his two friends with a self-complacent smile upon his face, which is habitual to him. I am a plain man, and a practical man, and I go to work in a plain, practical way. That's my way. There's not the least mystery or difficulty in dealing with this sort of people, the poor, if you only understand them and talk to them in their own manner. Now you, porter, don't you ever tell me or anyone else, my friend, that you don't, haven't always got enough to eat, and of the best, because I know better. I have tasted your tripe, you know, and you can't chafe me. You understand what chafe means, eh? That's the right word, isn't it? Lord bless you, said Alderman, turning to his friends again. It's the easiest thing on earth to deal with this sort of people, if you understand them. Famous man for the common people, Alderman Cute. Never out of temper with them. Easy, affable, joking, knowing gentlemen. You see, my friend, pursued the Alderman, there's a great deal of nonsense talked about want. Hard up, you know. That's the phrase, isn't it? And I intend to put it down. There's a certain amount of cant in vogue about starvation. And I mean to put it down, that's all. Lord bless you, said the alderman, turning to his friends again. You may put it down anything among this sort of people, if you only know the way to set about it. Your daughter, said the alderman, pointing at Meg. Always affable with the working class, is alderman cute. Knew what pleased him, not a bit of pride. Where's her mother, asked the worthy gentleman. Dead, said Toby. And you're going to marry her, are you? Yes, returned Richard. We're going to get married on New Year's Day. What do you mean? cried Filer Sharp, married. Why, yes, we're thinking of it, Master, said Richard. We're rather in a hurry, you see, in case we should be put down first. Ah, cried Filer with a groan. Put that down indeed, Alderman. You'll do something. Married, married. The ignorance, the first principles of political economy on part of this people. Their improvidence, their wickedness. In by heavens, enough. Now look at the couple, will you? A man may live to be as old as Methuselah, said Mr. Filer, may labour all his life for the benefit of such people as those, and may heap up facts on figures, facts on figures, facts on figures, mountains high and dry, and he can do no more hope than to persuade them they have no right or business to be married, than we can hope to persuade them they have no earthly right or business to be born. And that we know they haven't. We reduced it to mathematical certainty long ago. And then Mr. Filer says to Mr. Veck, 
How old are you, Mr. Vec? And he says, 60. And Mr. Filer says, well, you're well above average. <laughs> well, average age, average age in London at that time. If you were a gentleman, 44. If you were a clerk, 24. If you were a labourer, 23. Skewed, of course, by the large numbers of children born in birth. And so the story goes on. Now, Alderman Cute was based on one of Dickens' nemesis, Sir Peter Lorry. Sir Peter Lorry was a magistrate. He appears um, as a character. His idea was this. When women who um, have turned to prostitution, when they jump into the Thames to try and commit suicide, I'm going to deal with them and I'm going to sort that problem out, said Sir Peter Lorry. I'm going to transport them to Australia. I'm going to put them down. So that whole speech was attacking Sir Peter Lorry. Sir Peter Lorry spoke at the Marlebone Vestry about Jacob Islands in, in Dickens' Oliver Twist, denying that ever existed. Dickens always attacked the people who spoke in ignorance about the poor. The story goes on. The last slide. Music to your ears, the last slide. In this picture here, what's happened, we have... Toby Veck has fallen into a dream and the bells, or the spirit of the bells, who is a little girl called Lillian Fern, has shown him what will happen. What has happened here, this man is called Will Fern. Now Will Fern has committed a terrible crime because what Will Fern has done is he's left the country and he's had the audacity to come to London to look for work. What a terrible person he must have been to do that. And he's taken, he's burst in to this dinner, this Lady Bowley's birthday meal on New Year's Day. And this is what Will Fern says to these associated rich people. Who can give me back my liberty? Who can give me back my good name? Who can give me back my innocent niece? Not all the lords and ladies in wide England, but gentlemen, gentlemen, dealing with other men like me, begin at the right end. Give us in mercy better homes when we're lying in our cradles. Give us better food when we're working for our lives. Give us kinder laws to bring us back when we're going wrong. And don't set jail, jail, jailer for us everywhere we turn. There ain't a condensation you can show the labourer then that he won't take as ready and as, as grateful man can be. For he has a patient, peaceful, willing heart, but you must put his rightful spirit in him first. For whether he's a wreck and ruin such as me, or was like one of them that stands here now, his spirit is divided from you at this time. Bring it back, gentle folks, bring it back. Bring it back before the day comes when even his Bible changes in his altered mind, and the words seem to him to read, as they have sometimes read in my own eyes in jail, Whither thou goest, I cannot go. Where thou lodgest, I do not lodge. Your people are not my people, nor your God, my God. And in that passage, Dickens is crying out. Because, of course, the Will Fern would never be allowed to speak to people such as that. But Dickens uses Will Fern to appeal to the poor. And ladies and gentlemen, I think we will adjourn there.